we now consider a very simple application of the Cameron-Martin theorem. To do that, we consider a simplified problem of exchange rates. The idea is that we have two markets. These two markets have two different numeraires. Now, what is a numeraire in financial mathematics? A numeraire is nothing more than the unit of count that you use to express all the different quantities on the market. In our simple example, we will consider a euro market and a dollar market. In the euro market, the numeraire, the unit of count, is nothing more than the euro. In the dollar market, it's the dollar. Now, it is not compulsory to use currencies as numeraire. We will see later that we can use bonds, we can use stocks, we can use apples, we can use pears. So we can use whatever we want as units for counting for evaluating the value of other quantities. In this very simple situation, we just have the euro and the dollar. The concept of numeraire is extremely important. We will be back and we will see that essentially the definition of the numeraire is what really counts to define the Ries-Newton measure and the radon nucleon derivative. But again, I'm asking for your patience because you will see that now in a few lessons we will go very quickly through financial mathematics thanks to the things that we have gathered so far. Now we consider two markets and in each market there is a risk-free asset. There is a risk-free asset for the euro, for the euro investor, and there is a risk-free asset for the dollar investor. Now, a nice characteristic of the exchange rate problem is the following. If you are in the euro market and if you express all the quantities in euros, for you, the risk-free euro asset is risk-free. And this is the same if you are in the dollar market when you consider the risk-free dollar asset. But if you are in the dollar market and you look at the risk-free asset of the euro market, this is no longer risk-free for you. Why? Because you have to express the euro quantities into dollar quantities. And in order to do that, you need an exchange rate. Now, in our simple setting, this exchange rate will be modeled with a very basic stochastic process following a model that comes from the works of Robert Merton. On your screen, you can see a stylized representation of our exchange rate problem. So we have two different risk-free assets, one expressed in euros, that is the euro money account, and one expressed in dollars, the US money account. The euro account pays a risk-free interest rate expressed in euros, RE, and for the US market, we have a risk-free rate expressed in dollars, RU. As I was telling you before, what is risk-free for the euro investor is not necessarily risk-free for the dollar investor because of the exchange rate. Now, the exchange rate is the quantity YT, and what we assume is a Mertens-like model in which we assume that the exchange rate that tells us how many euros we can get with one dollar is a geometric Brownian motion, as the one that you see on your screen. Now, in the respective markets, the euro and the dollar, what we have is that the risk-free assets, our money account, have a deterministic behavior. If I invest one euro at time zero, in the money account, what I get at time t is the quantity et, which is nothing more than the exponential of ret. The same works for the dollar account. In that situation, if I invest one dollar at time zero, then at time t I will get the exponential of rut. Now, this is our framework. We start by considering the perspective of the euro investor. So our problem is to see what happens if we want to consider an investment in dollars 
made by the euro investor when the risk-free rate RU is no longer a completely risk-free quantity because of the exchange rate. So, let QE be the risk neutral probability for the euro investor. If the dollar euro exchange rate follows a stochastic differential equation of the form of 2.8, so what we said before in terms of Merton's model, and if the risk free rates are RU and RE for dollar and euro investors respectively, then under QE, the risk neutral measure for the euro investor, we have that mu needs to be equal to the difference between RE and RU. And that also implies that we can express yt as per equation 2.10 and under QE, the process bt is a standard Brownian motion. Now, the proof of this proposition is simple but very important because it allows us to, to see the Cameron Martin theorem in practice. Now, what we have is that uh, we just need to substitute the quantities we know and that, uh, that we have defined so far. Now, under QE, which is the risk neutral measure for the euro investor, we have that every discounted quantity in euros must be a martingale, because this is one of the things that we have proven under risk neutrality. Now, the discounted share price is nothing more than the quantity you see on your screen, so it's the exponential of minus RET times UTYT, which is the value in dollar of the US money account, that is then converted into euros using the exchange rate. Now, now substituting the definition of yt and then remembering what is the functional form for ut, we can essentially get the expression that you see on your screen. Now, what is important in, the, in this expression is that the first exponent is a non-random quantity while the second part defines a martingale. What type of martingale? Do you recognize something? It is indeed simple to identify this martingale as the exponential martingale we have been playing until now. In our notation, the second term, the exponential of minus sigma squared t over 2 plus sigma bt is nothing more than z sigma t. This is what we have to observe, and once we observe this, it is clear that the whole quantity is a martingale if and only if the exponential term in t disappears, and this only happens when mu is equal to Re minus Ru, so that the exponential term is equal to 1, and what remains is y0 times our exponential martingale, z sigma t. Proposition 12 is interesting, because it is nothing more than an application of the Cameron-Martin theorem, but it gives us a nice view of what is happening in practice when we use the Cameron-Martin theorem. Now, Proposition 12 tells us that when we consider the two risk-neutral measures, QE and QU, these two measures are mutually absolutely continuous, and moreover, we are also able to express, to easily express, what is the rather naked derivative connecting the two measures. Looking at the formula you have on your screen, it is easy to recognize the quantity z sigma t, so the exponential martingale of parameter sigma. The proof of proposition 12 is just a matter of substituting the quantities we have defined and recalling the properties of risk neutral measures. Recall that here we are playing with two different risk neutral measures, QE and QU. These are the risk neutral measures of the euro market and the dollar market. That is to say, QE is the risk neutral measure for the euro investor, but not for the dollar investor. 
and vice versa for QU. Now, what we know of the risk neutral measure is that under the risk neutral measure, every discounted price process or every discounted value process is a martingale, and the value in zero, so at time zero, of every portfolio of every strategy is nothing more than the discounted expected value of the portfolio at maturity. Exploiting this fact and just substituting our equations and comparing them, we end up with the solution of the radon nicotine derivative connected QU and QE that, with no big surprise, is an exponential martingale. Please notice that this exponential martingale is what we can call Z sigma t. So the leading parameter of this exponential martingale, of this radon nicotine derivative, is sigma, which represents the diffusion parameter in our stochastic representation of the exchange rate. Now, it is very important to observe this, to observe the role of sigma at this stage, because it will be something that we will also observe in the next uh, lessons about the Black and Scholes and Merton framework. So please spend a little bit of time trying to see why sigma is the leading parameter, and later in the course I will also tell you why. But it's always nice to try to figure out things on your own, because reasoning about these basic quantities of financial mathematics is, at least according to me, the best way to understand them. If you have a look at the lecture notes, you will see that the next topic in line is Virsanov theorem. Now, what we will do is to jump over this topic and we will be back, we will be necessarily back when needed. Why? Because what we are going to see in the next lessons can be solved, can be uh, analyzed just using Cameron Martin. Gersonov theorem is a sort of Cameron Martin on steroids. So it's a more general theorem with respect to Cameron Martin. Cameron Martin tells us how we can connect a running motion, a standard running motion, and a running motion with drift, where the drift, the psi for us, is a constant. Now, Cameron Martin can be easily generalized to the situation in which psi is substituted by a deterministic function, some sort of psi of t, that we can model, but for which no randomness is considered. Now, if, conversely, psi is substituted by a stochastic process itself, so if we introduce a non-deterministic drift for what concerns the Brunner motion, then the cameron martin theorem is no longer sufficient. That's when we need Gersanov theorem. So Gersanov theorem is the theorem that tells us how we can essentially connect by a change of measure, obviously, as usual, and using a, another type of martingale, which is not necessarily the simple exponential martingale we have considered so far, how we can connect a Brownian motion and a Brownian motion with non-deterministic drift. Now, this topic is something that we will, for sure, cover later in the course. So, for the moment, just skip these pages and go to the next chapter.